Excellent. Thank you very much, Angie. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the sec this session, Overcoming the Great Disconnection. So uh, a recent survey from the recruiting firm Robert Walters found that two-thirds of UK employees felt disengaged from the workforce, and about half of employees in the US similarly felt disengaged. And this, of course, has a huge impact on businesses, right? It affects um, you know, uh, employee retention, coming to the office, um, costs, uh, well-being is tied to uh, lower, employee well-being is tied to lower health care costs. And some estimates suggest that this is costing businesses over $300 billion every year. Um, but is this a new phenomenon, this notion of disconnection um, between employees and employers? Is it somehow uh, new or exacerbated by hybrid working, by the pandemic? Is it just that we're more aware of it and more willing to talk about it and actually there's actual will to try and address it? So uh, with me to address uh, some of these questions and hopefully help answer some of these questions, um, I'm very pleased to be joined by a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, first up, Ariane Tour, uh, CEO of Cigna Healthcare for Europe. Um, Jeff McDonald, a mental health campaigner, founder of Minds at Work and formerly at Unilever, and Jennifer Moss, uh, author of The Burnout Epidemic and Unlocking Happiness at Work. Thank you very much for joining me. So, Arian, I'm going to come to you first, um, and let's start with definitions. So, we've heard this term, the great disconnection. What does that mean? Does that have a significance to you? Do you believe that that is in fact, the case that we're seeing this sort of great big en masse disconnection between employees and employers, does that speak to your experience? It does, and uh, we do quite a bit of research amongst um, sort of uh, employees worldwide to better understand how they're feeling, and this is definitely one of the things that we picked up from the surveys that we've done more recently as well. And for me, when I think about the disconnect, it's actually twofold. One, um, I do think that increasingly we see employees that are disengaged from their work and disengaged from their, their employer. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to double click on that and sort of look mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, into the reasons why. But then secondly, I think there's also a disconnect in terms of uh, what employers think their employees are feeling versus what employees are really feeling. And I think that's another really important dimension of this, this disconnect. And why, why, is there, why is there that last disconnect? Aren't employers sort of doing surveys of employees and shouldn't they have their pulse on it? Why, is there, why do they think employees are feeling one way and, and, and in fact that's not the case? Well, I think firstly, um, not every employer is doing surveys. Mm. But I guess more importantly, there's a difference between doing surveys and actually listening and understanding. Mm. Those are two very different things. Mm. And if doing an employee engagement survey is a mechanical thing, and you're not really diving into the details yeah. of what you're finding and you're trying to find out what sits behind some of the answers that your employees are providing, then I think you're, you're gonna make assumptions and then ultimately you're gonna be proven wrong mm. as we're seeing in terms of you know, high numbers of uh, employees leaving organizations because they are disengaged, mm. even though employers might think everything is fine. Right. And Jen, you know, to what extent do you think this disconnection is due to hybrid working arrangements? Is it just because we're not spending as much time face to face together? I think that definitely plays a role. And, you know, I just want to echo the statements around gathering data. A big part of what we're missing is the gray area kind of um, learning. You know, I, I recommend this, um, this way of gathering the gray data, which is just having a weekly check-in, but making it structured so you're actually asking people how they're doing and how they're feeling, but then actioning the data. We have these looking back surveys. We have these one, one place, one time kind of surveys. So someone could be having a terrible day. They get cut off on the way to work and they're answering how their well-being is that day is not really indicative of what you know, our well-being is as well. So we need to start looking at using data in a much more micro way. And when it comes to hybrid, I do think that we swung the pendulum in a really far in one direction, which is actually great to make change. You really have to do push it. But 
I don't think we've figured out what this actually means. We have this very narrow focus around where we're working. Mm. And when we actually look at what we should be providing for people so that we have more connection is this freedom from, freedom to kind of way of thinking about it. So why if I have to you know, think about flexibility, it only has to be where I work instead of how I work, who I work with, when, you know, when I can start my shift. And there's way more f ways that we can create connections with people and have our employees be happier is if we give them those freedoms within the context of it, meaning that they're still not going to abuse it. You know, best lesson from the pandemic is that we allowed humans to do what they do. And guess what? They were productive and excelled at this, this experiment. And are people, are we, the studies show that people are working longer hours now in a hybrid working arrangement, right? Is that, is that the case? We've added two and a half more hours to the day, just that's the average data, but there's um, certain countries that are just working way more. The UK, US, Canada have exceeded that, um, some working four more hours per day, and it's because we don't look at rest as being productive, and we should be changing the way that we imagine um, our breaks or our time away as being part of the overall productivity goals of every individual and every employee. So if they don't choose to start working when they're, they had originally been commuting during that time, that doesn't mean that, you know, that they're not productive. It's about creating these, you know, cushions around the day that allow you to be more fueled. And because we are now, and the WHO is defined over 55 hours as actually being detrimental to our health, um, and a lot of people here probably work over 55 hours dangerously, but what we're finding that is that we're not actually achieving any more sort of, um, you know, goals aren't being met after 55, 60 hours. And so just understanding that we can have a four-day work week. It isn't totally radical if we remove a lot of these inefficiencies that are holding us back and creating more workload and, and then increasing burnout. Does anyone know, if, are there, is there any data showing that for companies that have adapted a four-day work week are now, the, the employees feel more engaged? Uh, absolutely, all the data, there's some excellent data and UK is doing a really good job of it. They're actually taking it on um, a pretty, like with high focus, but Microsoft tested it in their um, Japan team and it was unbelievable how not just they were meeting objectives and um, all of their production kind of metrics were being um, um, analyzed and they found that it was matching or exceeding their goals. And a lot of it is just, like you look at the Shopify, for example, they did a calendar purge and they ended up saving 320,000 hours just by making meetings uh, recurring meetings, they canceled all recurring meetings and made it so that when you have a meeting, you just have it when you need it, it's ad hoc, it's a la carte. And then any meetings that were 50 people or more were happening only on Wednesday from 11 to five. Mm. And what they found is that they ended up getting around a, um, the value of, um, of having an additional 150 more employees just through this calendar purge. And so I think what we're realizing is we're wasting a lot of time yeah. and um, we could be doing better. Mm. Really interesting. Um, Jeff, I want to come to you. Um, I think part of you know, the data suggests that what's driving this disconnection is that people don't feel purpose. They don't find meaning in their day-to-day -day work. And yet at the same time, companies more and more are thinking of themselves and talking about purpose and being purpose-driven. So what, what, why is there that misalignment there? Is it misaligned expectations? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much purpose washing that exists in organizations today. Mm. You know, we've got this wonderful purpose, which is to save the world. Well, guess what? What really matters is the quarterly results, whether we grow and whether we're profitable. Mm. Um, and I think there's a huge disconnect between being a purpose-led organization, which has got a lovely purpose statement that gathers dust in the top drawer, and people every single day feeling that they are contributing individually to that sense of purpose. You know, it reminds me of Kennedy when he went to NASA and he said to the guy uh, at NASA who was sweeping the floor, he said, well, what do, you, what do you do here? And he said, I'm here to put a man on the moon, not I'm the floor sweeper. Mm. You know, there's that real connection. And there are very, very few companies out there today 
that have truly rediscovered a sense of purpose in a very inclusive way, rather than a bunch of executives sitting around a table and saying, this is the purpose of our organization. Um, Any examples? And, beg your pardon? Any examples of companies that Well, have been... Patagonia is a wonderful example of a truly purpose-led organization. A mild company, absolutely, it completely transformed the performance of Unilever. But I can tell you, we began to embed it into everything that we did as an organization, into the brands. I mean, I remember being told by Paul Pullman after, you know, uh, helping to archetype our transformation. He said to me, he said, look, if we still have a corporate social responsibility function in two years' time, I'll fire you. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to live out our sense of purpose through CSR. We'll live out our sense of purpose through what we do as an organization, through the brands that we offer to people out there, whether that's to enhance their well-being, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, I think that, um, I think there's also a structural issue, Jonathan. You know, for as long as organizations and the success of an organization is determined by their quarterly results, um, for as long as that exists, it's really, really difficult to be a truly purpose-led organization. Hmm. I do, I do oh, want to yeah, sort of build a bridge between mm. this conversation about purpose and uh, the discussion we just had about virtual working or yep. working from home. I think it's really, really challenging to be able to create that sort of purpose-led organizational culture in an environment where everybody only works remotely. Mm. Um, I believe that it's really important, especially for a younger generation entering the workforce, to be able to be immersed in that culture and in that purpose through direct and personal interactions. I think the same study that you referenced indicates that more than 50% of people between 18 and 34 actually indicate that they find their work, work to be transactional. That's, that's a real big problem, and I think that's one of the key drivers of that disengagement that we're discussing today. So I do believe that to be able to cr not just create that purpose, but also get people to truly buy into it, and to Jeff's earlier point, understand the individual contribution that they can make to delivering on that purpose, you have to bring people back. Not all the time and everywhere, but just mm. you know, in a very balanced way. Yeah, because it does feel like there's maybe a bit of a tension there, right? People want more flexibility, they want to be able to work from home, but they also want that purpose. And if they're not there, face-to-face, -face, um, you know, participating in that culture, it might be difficult. Jen, I think you wanted to Yeah, I want to add to that because, uh, you know, I put it out there th that maybe we do need to have a different way of looking at hybrid. And, um, and the fact that we can work remote is, is a, has been a great experiment, and there's a lot of people that are valuing that. I know myself as a mid-career mom of three, that there's that flexibility really plays a role for me and, and helps me in my world, but I have had that experience of working in an office where I have established who I am, I have the network, I've learned how to you know manage conflict, I've learned all of these things that you need to have by being in that space for a period of time, we need to look differently at what that hybrid looks like. It, it's like we've been just told that it's two days a week and three days out and or whatever it is, instead of looking at it like, you know, even just Tracy mentioned from Moderna, getting the whole group together for a week or doing, you know, pockets of time where we spend to, time together to bond and create those relationships. And the worst thing that we can do is send people into an office where it's a ghost town. So they're traveling in from their mm. remote place and then they're basically on Zoom all day. And when you look at the fact that we are now, which is I think really interesting about the disconnection piece, the way that we're looking at um, developing friendships with the people we're working with, our desire is no longer, in the personality types, is no longer if they're funny, if they make us laugh, if we have shared interests. We're now looking at are they um, competent? Do they have certain skills that are going to help me achieve my goals? And that's not actually when you really look at purpose and driving connection. Those characteristics are not as bonding neurally as mm -hmm. laughing with someone, as shaking someone's hand, as connecting with them in person. And so we're creating this further, even just neural disconnection from people in our in our workplaces, and and then it you know moves into our community where we're seeing so much more loneliness. Mm. Um, so Ariane, I want to come to you. So despite um, you know 
more, more and more employees are experiencing burnout, I want to come back to that, but they're working longer hours, and yet there's still this, this notion of productivity paranoia. Managers yep. are, feel as if people just are not working as hard if they're not in front of them, right? Um, so, you know, how can employers sort of inspire workforces and help to manage this productivity paranoia phenomenon, because obviously that must be driving feelings of disconnection and disengagement as well. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a really important uh, challenge and something that organizations need to try and address heads on. We really need organizations to shift from managing output to managing outcome. Mm. At the end of the day, it's about the outcome, it's not about the output. And I think it's really important that managers across all levels in an organization start to understand that. To get to higher productivity, it's not about micromanaging people. To get to higher productivity of an organization, it's actually about trust and it's about empowerment. Right? Those are the two things that ultimately will determine whether or not people are bringing the best version of themselves to work. Mm. That's what's going to drive up engagement combined with purpose, with leadership and with wonderful colleagues to uh, laugh with, to have jo make jokes with, etc. So I think it's really, really important that that shift happens. That means enabling our people managers across organizations to change the way in which they think about this again to make that shift from output to outcome mm. um, because those are new skills that we need our people managers to to learn and to adopt um, so yeah i think it's a really important part of the of the shift that we're looking to make in organizations mm. and I, I said i wanted to come back to this point about burnout um jen i mean you wrote the book on burnout um you know are we in fact seeing higher numbers of people experiencing some form of burnout and, and what's, what's driving it based on your research? Yes, you know, I started writing the book and writing uh, about the topic for years before I actually ended up in the pandemic and everything really shifted and obviously the book changed. But what I saw is the fact that we were in this acute situation that we thought would be over in a few weeks or a month that dragged on for, for years. And you cannot just, you just, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, neurally, you can't live in that state of surge capacity for that long. So what I think happened within the workplace, because burnout is um, about institutional stress left unmanaged, um, that it isn't in, according to the WHO, in our own individual control, we have a part of it that's in our control, but a lot of it is institutional. What happened is that a lot of companies just said, oh, it's business as usual. Let's still meet our growth goals or even exceed our growth goals. There was still high expectation to you know, drive profit. And all of that has to, you, you still need to drive profit. You still need to meet you know, shareholder expectations. That has to happen. But there wasn't this approach to it that we need to think differently of how we're going to hit those growth um, measures and how we're going to actually do our business in a pandemic. And so it was just crisis mode for years. And so we're seeing burnout happen because we just as human beings cannot withstand that much chronic stress and then still having to hit those functions. And, and also when our brains are under chronic stress, we're in fight or f uh, flight or freeze, it actually starts to make it that it's difficult to, to use our executive functioning part of the brain, so that part that just makes the simple decisions, the things that we need to do our work effectively every day. And that brain fogginess actually made it so that every goal was harder to achieve. Mm -hmm. Every situation was a little bit more difficult. It was harder to meet those sales targets because we were in a state of inertia. And that was not, I don't think, considered and so this is why we're seeing just really high burnout rates across our global workforce and people hitting the wall. And that's when you see the great resignation and people, you know, quietly quitting and all of those other trends that TikTok has made famous, even though they've been a problem for a long time. Mm. And Jeff, I, I mean, you're a campaigner around mental health. Um, obviously, you worked in Unilever before. You now run a charity, Minds at Work. You know, what, what would you advise people in terms of, or what do you think about uh, the extent to which companies have been able to focus on mental health? Has it been, are you seeing a kind of shift of companies focusing on that? And also if, if those in the audience, you know, want their company to do more, what, what would you say they should be focused on? I suppose it all depends uh, which part of the world I'm sitting in, mm. in answering that question. Mm -hmm. So here in the UK, 
I would say Canada, I would say Australia. I think they've made real strides in opening up the conversation around mental ill health. Because I often say that mental health, brand mental health is the most damaged brand I have ever, ever come across. Mm -hmm. When you use the word mental health, people immediately go to depression or anxiety. Mm. When I use the word physical health, people don't immediately go to cancer, diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I, think that, um, I think that there are parts of the world where we've really, this conversation is taking place. Uh, and it's a little bit easier to talk about my mental ill health or emotional ill health struggles. Um, but we've got a long, long way to go. We've got a long, long way to go. We're, I often say we're at the base camp of Everest. Mm. We're at the base camp of Everest. Um, but yes, you know, uh, the journey that I've been on over the last 10 years after leaving Unilever, I mean, one of the insights that I've had is that the most limiting resource that I see in workplaces today, the most limiting resource, is the energy of people. Hmm. People are frazzled. People are frazzled. They are frazzled. They can't wait for a Friday afternoon, and they don't really look forward to a Monday morning. And I would argue that energy is the most critical enabler of performance of an individual, how energized you feel, how passionate you are about what you are doing. And we can only be energized if we are healthy. Mm. If we are healthy, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And so my provocation to a lot of organizations, and, and one of the reasons why I have got so behind this pledge that Cigna talks about, which is trying to get organizations to take more accountability to enhancing the energy and the health of their people. I mean, why do organizations not want healthy, energized, happy people working for them? Tell me why. But why do we only treat it as a kind of week called the well-being week, <laughs> where I look after you for one week of the year, guess what, cheap as I care for you for one week of the year, or I've given you a Headspace app, go and use it. Yet we've got all these cultural barriers and leaders not taking this seriously enough and seeing it as a strategic imperative. And what I love about your pledge, um, Signa, is that you are, is you are targeting leaders to start to see the whole well-being. And by the way, I don't love the word well-being, all right? Because the CFO just rolls their eyes at me when I talk about well-being. But when I talk about energy and passion, mm. they are, okay, yeah, all right. But I can only be energized if I'm healthy. And so how can we get leaders, and through the work that, that you guys are doing, Cigna, and the pledge, to begin to shift the culture of the organization, to see it as a strategic imperative? A strategic imperative. Because every other strategic imperative is about driving the performance of that organization. Mm. Why, don't you want, why don't you want the well-being and the energy of your people to be a strategic imperative? Why is it a banana next to the till in the canteen? And guess what? I care for you now. <laughs> mm. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. Um, <laughs> it was very good. But, uh, um, but yeah, yeah, so I think we've got, we've got a lot to do. And, uh, and when it comes to the mental health agenda, I mean, having mentally healthy people is of competitive advantage. Why wouldn't you want to have that in your organization? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, tell us about the pledge uh, then. Yeah, so basically we launched this initiative uh, towards the end of last year, very much based on the many conversations that we've had with employers all around the world mm. who are all faced with very similar challenges in terms of this, this mental uh, health issues in the workplace and how that's impacting their ability to achieve their overall business objectives. So. What we, what we decided to do is put out this 5% pledge, which is effectively a call on leaders, business leaders, across all industries, all organizations, to openly commit 5% of their working time on addressing mental health in the workplace. Um, and why did we feel that that was important? Because as with any significant change in organizations, it always starts from the top. The tone from the top is really, really important. And if leaders are willing to step up and say, I'm dedicating 5% of my time and my leadership's time to addressing mental health in the workplace, that's a, that's a bold statement. Mm. That's, that's saying that you recognize that there is an issue. That's giving people in the organization permission to start to talk about this, 
which we all know is really important because there is still a significant stigma attached to mental health. So it's difficult for people to open up. But it's not just about saying it's important, it's actually doing something about it. And yeah. the 5% time commitment is an action orientation. It means you actually have to follow through because now that you've made the statement, people can also hold you accountable and say, so what are you doing? How are you spending this 5% of the mm. time? Mm. Once organizations have signed up, and by the way, we have more than 700 organizations now signed up to the pledge, and this, this number is only going up as this becomes more and more of a movement. What we're looking to do is obviously work with these organizations to support them to try to answer the question that you asked, which is, where do you even start? Mm. Um, and then secondly, we also try to create a virtual community of like-minded organizations and like-minded business leaders mm. to give them the opportunity to start to share best practices as well as things that did not necessarily work mm. because there is no silver bullet. There's not one thing that you can do and implement to uh, make a, a big impact in your organization. It's going to have to be multiple things. And working and sharing ideas and best practices is a, is a great way to actually get there. So that's in a nutshell what the 5% pledge is about. But great. Jonathan, for yeah. me, the, the, yeah. you know what's, what I think is so important in this space now is, I mean, I think COVID and post-COVID, I mean, I think it was a real catalyst to a conversation around well-being, right? But I think what we've seen is organizations doing well-being to their people. Mm. Mm -hmm. To their people. And I, I think there's also, there's also a responsibility for organizations to do well-being to the organization. And so I think it takes two to tango. I think, yes, there's individuals have got to take accountability to enhance and look after the most valuable thing they have in their life. It's their health. Anybody in this audience, I would challenge you to tell me what's more important than your health. But then organizations also have to take accountability to enhance the health and the well-being of people. And I think if they did that in a strategic way, this whole bit around connection and feeling engaged and working for an organization where, you know what, imagine an employee value proposition which says, come and work for Cigna. You know why? Because we'll enhance your life. I can tell you most organizations I go into, people's lives are diminished by <laughs> going to work. They're not being enhanced by going to work. And it's sad. Because work gives you a sense of purpose, it gives you routine, it gives you the opportunity to build relationships and a sense of community. I mean, work should be life enhancing. What have we done to it? Mm. What have we done to it? Mm. And, so, and so it requires leaders to bring about some of this organizational shift. We spend billions in health and safety all over the world. Billions. Guess what? It all goes to safety. It all goes to keeping you physically safe at work. Why don't I want to keep you emotionally and mentally safe at work as well? Mm. And, and, and so I think the organizational accountability piece is huge. And we should go on an employee well-being holiday and focus on organizations shifting their cultures. Mm. Well, we were just talking in, uh, behind, backstage before the panel started about how this was often given the responsibility for looking at employee well-being was given to the, the HR leader, <laughs> right? Oh. Um, but Jen, I think you were saying that there's an increasing trend to see a kind of chief well-being officer. Yeah, we're seeing that happen. A chief well-being officer is now uh, one of the, and the chief mental health officer is now one of the sort of the hottest new jobs. I mean, this is in Canada and the US. I'm not sure how that's translating in other countries yet, but international companies are also promoting that. And I think when we have something existing in any sort of organization without true KPIs attached to it, without expectations, um, and a person accountable to any program, it's just not going to be successful. We know that you have you know, chief operations officer managing the operations and they have expectations and CEOs and CFOs. So if we really do, as an organization, pledge to make this um, a priority, then we need to have someone in that role that's, that's overseeing it and their success is attached to the success of you know, the, the promise that they're making to employees. And I think now that we're going into this five generation workforce under this umbrella now, um, and there's really big differences between every persona within those organizations, we're seeing that divide really widen. It doesn't mean that that's bad. You know, we're, 
one of the things that I get frustrated around is this idea that, you know, it's young Gen Zs and millennials just whining about their work-life balance. And I, I, I take real offense to that because when you really think about why we have healthier, you know, more well um, groups, demographics, uh, one of them is that we're our happiest in our life at 70. So for anyone in the room, if that's in their 40s, it's the saddest time of your life and you're on an uphill trajectory, so <laughs> you're welcome. But that point, the U curve really where we are really the most stressed is at that 20, you know, five, the, the kind of the quarter century crisis where we're trying to figure out our plan, where we have debt, where we have low control, low agency inside of an organization. And now what we've done for the last four years out of university is spend it isolated and alone. And so now here you're in this place where you feel just in a crisis of what you should do. And that's why we're seeing a lot of what's the pointism with these groups. And when we're talking about kind of well-being across this new gen gen big generation, you need to have someone thinking about well-being at that high level, especially when you look at you know, Gen Z's coming in. Balance and flexibility is a right, not a perk. And they will leave if that is gonna, if that's not your, you know, part of the equation. They have a different mindset around what their expectations are of sharing opinions and feeling engaged. They were raised where their opinion mattered, where they were asked how they felt about things. They wanted to contribute. And so then, you know, you go in a workplace where you don't have contributions. And then they also, you know, get a lot of technology thrash where they are, you know, using AI in the real world and then they come in and they can't, they're asked to learn Excel. I mean, we need to be better at understanding that this, from a well being and connection standpoint, we need to be looking across the generations and figuring out how to make those connections even more um, tight, more compassionate, more compatible, more engaged. And I think there's a lot of kind of fear of that right now. And instead of radical acceptance that this is different, we've changed, we're not jamming the toothpaste back, back in the tube, this is it. And think about your alpha generation coming in, that's gonna be a whole new ball game. So instead of pushing back on it being frustrated, we need to look at how we um, bring everyone into the tent. And when you have productive relationships in a work, you're 41% less likely to burn out. You're 27% more likely to get promoted. And you have better psychological safety and health benefits in your personal life. So making these connections is not just good for productivity and, and a great business case. It's also good for our own just overall life satisfaction. And so all of those reasons make it so that we need to think differently about you know, work right now. Mm. John, I'm, I'm not against the chief well-being officer. I think it's a great role that can help to sort of coordinate and put a very comprehensive body of work together within an organization. The risk, of course, is if it becomes an excuse to say, oh, yeah, no, we have a chief well-being officer, mm. so let's increase the targets. Right? Then, then, then you still have an issue in an organization. I, I firmly believe that this does need to come from the top, and I think there's nothing more powerful than the CEO walking out of the office at lunchtime with the gym back uh, on his back, right? Mm -hmm. Or the CEO saying, I've had a very difficult week. I've struggled. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of things that I think will ultimately set the tone. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the chief well-being officer with the right level of empowerment mm -hmm. and resources is going to be able to then move the ball forward on that. Employees can't be what they can't see. So this idea of, you know, uh, I want you all to focus on well-being for a week, but I'd never engage in self-care or model self-care mm. is a really big problem. And we're seeing that across the board. And a lot of, you know, executive leaders aren't good at feeling like they can model self-care. So you need to have it very inclusive and you need to be intentional about it. There's a, a role that leaders have to play to say, I'm going to walk the talk, and so then you can then feel like you can. You know, it can't be that dusty ping pong table where everyone's like, hey, let's all play ping pong, you know, ping pong, but it, no one ever does because they're working 80 hours a week. That's how we need mm -hmm. to kind of change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see, I know we have some audience questions coming in. Um, ah, there we go. 
Um, let me just turn around here. Um, so the first one, uh, Patagonia, a B Corp, is focused on removing shareholder supremacy. Is this the future for real purposeful businesses? Can it really work for global businesses? I believe, Jeff, you mentioned Patagonia. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I do believe it can work for global businesses. I, I really do. I mean, you know, the shareholder is not the most important stakeholder in an organization. There are all sorts of other stakeholders that we should bring value to. And my experience in Unilever is as you bring more value to a greater bunch of stakeholders, that drives the performance, both the growth and the profitability of the organization. But as I said, we have a structural issue in how we, in how we assess the success, assess the success of an organization, mm. which is growth, profitability, and quarterly results. And, and, and that drives short-termism. And you can, I, I honestly believe you can only be a truly purposeful organization if you are more long-term in your thinking. Mm. You know, and you take family businesses like a Mars, for example, another good example. You know, these are family organizations that have been around for years and years and years. Why? Because they take decisions for the long term and they're more purposeful in their, in their approach. Mm. Now, Jonathan, I think there is a, a silver lining here, which is um, we're in an environment, as we all know, where there's a war on talent and certain resources and skill sets are becoming very scarce. Mm. Organizations that are not addressing this issue will ultimately no longer be able to deliver on their business objectives, which means shareholder dissatisfaction, right? So there's, there's, there comes a point, and it's approaching us very rapidly, where you have no other choice but then to embrace this workplace well-being, because it's really going to be the only way for you to be able to attract and retain talent, and therefore achieve your overall objectives as a business, which is also in the best interest yeah. of shareholders. Mm -hmm. Um, Arjen, this, this uh, question at the top here, I think you mentioned shifting from you know, measuring outcome rather than input. Yeah. Does the productivity metric require radical change? Isn't it building relationships or mentoring also being productive? It is. Yes, absolutely. And, but I don't think that you have to measure all of that. If you ultimately measure outcomes, then you know, that is a, a sum of you know, people doing individual jobs, but also people supporting each other and teams collectively delivering uh, excellent results. And I absolutely agree that those are the type of things that we should uh, acknowledge. And I love what you said, Jen, about it's actually also taking time off or taking downtime or not being busy mm -hmm. focusing on work is ultimately part of what you need to do to be able to deliver uh, those business objectives. So I think looking at this much more holistically is really important. Does it make it more complex to measure it? Probably yes. And in certain roles, measuring output is a lot easier than in other roles. Mm. But ultimately, again, this is also about leadership skills, the ability to sit down with people on your team to have a, an output-related conversation, not an, uh, you know, a conversation, sorry, an outcome-focused uh, um, conversation. Um, requires a specific skill set, but it's ultimately what's going to drive the right behaviors. Okay, interesting. So we have just a minute left. The clock is flashing at us. Um, interesting question here, uh, probably bigger than uh, to address in one minute about the metaverse playing a role, which is an interesting one. But I just want to give each of you uh, one last thing to say, a piece of practical advice um, for those in the audience um, about how they can help to, to sort of bridge and, and solve this disconnection, this connection issue? Well, you know, I will address very quickly the metaverse um, conversation because it is something that um, we need to discuss. But really, I just want to say, you know, empathy building and empathy as a leadership skill is maybe the most important mm. cognitive effort we all need to be making. And being able to develop empathy is literally, you know, being in another person's shoes and taking on, you know, their feelings and their experiences. And there are really great virtual ways that we can do that, that we can connect with them. And so I think it's, uh, I would say that if we could do anything right now, it's just to learn how we can build our own cognitive empathy, because the more that we can actively listen and action change, the more likely we will be to, um, to have a better workforce. Brilliant. Arjen? I want to finish where we started, Jonathan, which is listen to your employees. Mm. To Jeff's point, don't do well-being to them. You know, do this together. So it's really important to listen. And that is in two ways. Right? One is uh, through surveys, uh, you know, Cigna makes a health risk assessment available to all people that sign up for the pledge. So that's a tool that you can use to actually better understand what's really going on within your workforce. And then to sit together with your uh, team members to actually design the solutions that are fit for purpose. 
but also the continuous individual check-ins and team check-ins are incredibly important because you have to do this together, you have to shape this together. There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's not like here is the program and this is going to solve all of your mm. mental health issues. Mm. It's going to look different for every organization. So again, hopefully we can create that virtual community of like-minded businesses and like-minded leaders that can continuously share their experiences and that's how we learn together to ultimately get better at this. Mm. Jeff, briefly, final word. Last bit of practical advice to all the HR professionals sitting in the room. Please change the performance management equation. Mm -hmm. So performance equals knowledge plus skill plus experience plus behavior. Multiply that all by health, energy. Because when health and energy is zero, P is zero. Mm -hmm. P is zero. Mm -hmm. So rethink that whole equation of how we assess uh, the performance of our people in organizations. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Thank yeah. you in the audience. Um, over to you, Angie. Thank you.